Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod's Life Ministry. We're sharing the stories and insights of real people living out God's love for the people He's created. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us for episode 23. I'm your host, Steph Nugebauer, and today we have a special guest, Kyla Rodriguez, on the show. Uh, Kyla, we are over 20 episodes in, and I felt that for a show that was titled Friends for Life, it was high time that we talked about what it means to be a friend. I think you probably know as well as I do that that pop culture, like uh, music, TV, movies, magazines, have in the last few decades really capitalized on friendship. There's a whole 10 seasons of a show called Friends, so popular and loved that it has been nominated for over 60 Emmys. I think most of us, even if we've never watched a single episode of that show, can recognize the theme song of that show. So that's pretty telling. But if we're learning what friendship is from uh, 10 seasons of a TV show or even how it's portrayed in movies or magazine articles on social media, then I think we're, we're bound to kind of veer off into some weird territory and start to view friendship as maybe something other than what it was intended for. And friendship is a gift uh, given by God, and we can recognize that as Christians. And to be a friend is to have a vocation. And as such, friendship then is less about what others can do for us and more about how we can love and serve another. And so, listeners, I have brought Kyla on to walk us through uh, this very thing, to draw us back to friendship as the way that God sees it not as how the world tells us it is or should be. As a little bit of background, I met Kyla during my early years in St. Louis and then the seminary, and I joined a Bible study she was leading. And this Bible study formed a community, which in turn formed friendships out of that, at a time where many young adults, like myself, were very much seeking friendship. And something that has always struck me about Kyla is her ability to to bring people together and to form and maintain friendships and to do the hard work of keeping those connections, even through different life stages. So, Kyla, thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand it over to you. Can you introduce yourself to our listeners and maybe tell us about your cute little family? Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me, Steph. I just think this is so fun and it's great. Like you said, we've actually known each other for quite a long time, really most of our adulthood. We met each other before we were married, definitely before we had kids. So it's always fun to reconnect and kind of come full circle on the other side of, I mean, I was thinking about it. And since we knew each other before we got married, we've known each other for almost a decade, I think, if I'm doing the math right, which is You're doing the math right which is kind of wild to think about. I don't know if you remember this, but in the very early days of just trying to make friends and make connections, you invited me to come hang out with you at the pool. I have someone (laughs) who's out there staying with. And, you know, it's just one of those things where it was the first time I had moved to a city by myself before. It was the first time I was trying to make friends not in a college setting. And we didn't know each other well. And there's probably a hundred reasons I could have said no. But just the fact that you had invited me I didn't have a good reason to say no, right? And so who could have imagined that sitting in a pool in St. Louis a decade ago would lead us to being on a podcast together talking about friendship. But I think that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. I forgot I had that pool that I didn't have. (laughs) Yes. I don't even remember how you had the connection to the pool. I know it wasn't your pool. but Yeah. I was was staying at a dear couple's house when I first started seminary and they had a, a guest house and they had this beautiful home and property and they had a pool. So it wasn't even my pool, but they opened it up to me. And so I guess I took the initiative to open it up to other people. <laughs> yeah, I can I can honestly picture it in my brain, but it's funny just to just to think back on a very different time in life where we're having a different conversation. So now I don't live in St. Louis. I live in northern Wisconsin where my husband is a pastor. Uh, this is his first call. So we have been here for just a little over two years. We moved, uh, we finished at the seminary and moved to this area about six months before kind of the pandemic started. And then we have three kiddos. So my oldest is five and then my daughter, that's my son. And then my daughter is three and my youngest daughter is brand new and she is three months old. They sure are precious. And we were just talking about before coming on how pretty much, you know, on track with each other 
your boy is as old as my boy, your middle girl is as old as my girl. And then now we're kind of lagging behind you in the in the newborn <laughs> department, but, but soon to be joining you. Yeah. So can you tell us your degree is in, is it, is DCE a degree? It is. So I graduated from Concordia University, Chicago, where director of Christian education is the degree that you okay. get. Um, it is also like a certification. It depends on the Concordia that you go to, kind of how they word that, I guess. But for me, it was my degree was director of Christian education. And then that comes with a minor in theology. So that's kind of my educational background. So for two years now, you've been at that call, but you've really been in, in ministry now for about 10 years ever since mm-hmm. graduating college. So yeah, exactly. Well, thank you for, for joining us. Kyla, let's set some ground rules here because I realize that today's conversation has some limitations and, and rightly so, because we've got an hour to talk about something. We kind of have to be more specific. Today, though, we're going to talk about adult friendships in particular. And while adult friendships are not unlike childhood friendships in some ways, in many ways we recognize that having friends as an adult naturally matures the relationship and changes a bit. And also recognize that forming these friendships as we enter adulthood, well, it gets trickier. (laughs) And so we'll talk about those challenges to build and maintain adult friendships along with the blessings that come with that. And then finally, a kind of a point rather obvious, but still needs to be made that we are two adult women. And a lot of these um, concepts we'll talk about will apply really across the board for, for guy friendships and female friendships. But we realize also that there's a different dynamic that male friendships have that we we just can't tap into as ladies. So I see that as a, another future episode where I invite uh, one or two dudes to come on to talk about friendship from their perspective. So does that sound good? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Kyla, I guess my first question is, why do you think it's worth talking about friendship on a show that's called Friends for Life? Well, I love the tagline for your show where you talk about living out God's love for the people that he created. So I think that you can't not talk about it, right? That God's, if we're living out God's love for the people that he created, friendships are a part of that that you can't separate out. It's not like its own category of how you interact with people. It comes with the territory. Yes, absolutely. It comes with the territory. (laughs) And what we're doing here now, we're about a year into launching Friends for Life is we're trying to build a community that is centered around life issues and the gospel. And so the hope is that you quite literally will become our friend for life. And then so by living that out, we'll draw others into that as well. Let's uh, start with fundamentals. Okay. So fundamentally, what is friendship? That question is, I think, honestly hard to answer because we all bring so much into like the idea of friendship as an adult. Like when you're thinking about friendship as an adult, you've had so many different kinds of relationships up to this point in your life. Then now when you're thinking about friendship, (laughs) that word is going to mean something so different to everybody. We were talking a little bit beforehand that I, on Instagram, I asked my community that same question. I said, what is friendship? And the answers I got all had so many qualifying words. People were describing to me not just what friendship was. They were saying a real friend is this. A Mm. good friend is this. An organic friendship is this. And so I think that we bring honestly just baggage into the word friendship as adults because now we've had experiences positive and negative that are coloring this idea of this relationship with another person. And to the point that when we're when I'm asking you point blank, what is a friendship? Now you're processing through, well, I know what friendship might be, but I want to tell you what I want a good friend to be. And I really think the word that we're not going to use, but we want to use is that we want to uh, define what an ideal friendship is, what a perfect friendship or relationship looks like. Hmm. So as an adult in your 30s. Do you have what you would consider an ideal friendship with anyone? You know, I think ideal, right, is hard because we're humans and we enter into relationships with other humans and we're sinful. (laughs) So no, you know, I don't think there's an ideal friendship. I have 
friends that I have had for a long time and we have gone through a lot of life together and we have chosen to continue to value our relationship through those life stages. But I also am an adult who has moved for the better part of a decade, almost every year or two. So I have gone through a lot of seasons of just geographical location and that changes what friendship looks like every every move along the way really and and how I approach it too right as I'm constantly have moved and been in new scenarios along with my own new life seasons of marriages and kids yeah well I think you have rightly assessed some of the just the the natural things in life that cause transitions in friendships and Mm -hmm. and that would be one moving geographically which I I can also relate to um, as a as a pastor's wife but then when you're in in seminary you move at least uh let's say four times because you move to seminary then you move for vicarage and then you move back after the year of vicarage and then you move again (laughs) after (laughs) seminary to your first call it is a lot of moving and you're kind of you're kind of nomads. But also, I know other people can relate to that, too, who aren't just pastor's families. There are a lot of people on on the move. And then in addition to that, yeah, it's just a change in, in age and then life stages. So whether you're single or married or whether you have children or a different life stage would be, I guess, being an empty nester and having adult friendships then at that point in your life. So there's all different kinds of things that go on in seasons of life that can cause friendships to to be a huge blessing through that, but also to change shape or form during those times too. Yeah. And what we found is that, you know, we moved to this area about six months before everything kind of shut down in March of 2020, right? Where everybody was in the exact same <laughs> scenario. And so even what I have reflected on as, you know, the years have gone on is that a lot of skills that we have developed for making friends as adults, the legs were kind of pulled out from underneath of us, right? Like entertaining people in our home and the hospitality that comes from that and the way that you're able to build connections. So I'm sure that many other people are in that same boat that you might, whatever skill set you had for making friends or maintaining relationships, we've all had to come up with a really different way to interact with people in general, let alone a friendship relationship. And there's a learning curve to that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Oh my. I have I haven't even thought about that in, in terms of this conversation, but my husband and I moved here too just months uh before the pandemic hit. And you're right. It's a whole different skill <laughs> set to form friendships and and, you know, lend a, a hand toward friendship when you are, you know, drawn, have to draw into your home. <laughs> you can't go out and, and mingle with people. You know, it sounds like for, for you, and this, this is true for me, some, for some reason, God has chosen to bless me with, with lots of good friends, not by any um, stretch of things that I do, but I think he's just placed people in my life so that in every season so far, I've always, I've always had friendships. And that started out in my early elementary years and then into to high school. I have friends from high school who are still very dear to me. And then in different transitions of life in college and in adulthood and even in different you know places that we've served in ministry, um, we've been blessed with, with good friends. And we'll get to talk about this later, how kind of God has a unique role in, in bringing people together in this. So this is a podcast that is, of course, centered in the gospel and grounded, hopefully, in scripture. <laughs> and so if it's hard to, to define friendship, then where do we go? And I guess I'm going to answer that question. The scriptures, I think, really inform us about what friendship was made to be. So what does it say about friendship in scripture and, and how does the Bible really kind of shape our understanding of friendship. Yeah, I think that this is where as Christians that we have just such a gift, we are not exclusively the only people that struggle with friendship, right? Like that's a human 
That's a human condition, whether you believe in God's word or not. But as people who do believe in God's word and the power that it has and the truth that it tells us, we actually have a place to turn to to see why it is that we're struggling so much with this. Because really, as I look at this struggle for friendship, what I really see is it's just drawing us back to the fact that we need the relationship we have with God and that that's how he created us. It wouldn't be such a struggle if he didn't create us to be in relationship with other people. If that's not how God created us, if that's not who God himself is, right? He is a God of relationship. We see that in the Trinity first and goes out from there, right? If he didn't create us in his image and his image is one that is relationship, we would. this wouldn't be an issue because it wouldn't matter to us. Like we wouldn't care about other people, but Instead, we're made in the image of God, and He cares about other people, which is where we kind of start from knowing it's it's okay that you're desiring friendship because that is who God made us to be, to be people that want to be with other people and around other people. So that in and of itself just encourages me to know that this isn't something I'm struggling with that is selfish. It can be. It certainly can be right, but it's something that is a desire because I'm a child of God. And as a child of God, I can't help myself but want to be in relationship with other people. You know, you look at the entire Bible and it's relationship after relationship after relationship. And what I appreciate is it's the good and the bad that comes with being in relationship with other people. The Bible is not just a story after story of like, here is how to have a good friend or a real friend or a perfect friend or an ideal friend. It's a story of here is how people are in relationship with each other and how they have been for all of time. And here is how it's played out. And the only consistency in all of that is that when Christ is present, there's a difference in the relationships and how they function together. Hmm. So some examples of friendship in the Bible, I'm just thinking off the cuff here. Um, Jonathan and David, even Ruth and Naomi, kind of an intergenerational friendship, even though they were also still still family. And then Jesus himself called his disciples friends as well. And I think to, to start at the starting point that you did of who God is in his Trinitarian relationship, and then also out of creation in Genesis, he says we were created for relationship in that it is not good for man to be alone. So what does that mean? Well, I guess in part, it means that we're not meant to live in isolation, certainly, and that we're interdependent of each other. And that's how we were created. And that is good. That's a very good thing. And then all throughout the scriptures and Proverbs even has some really good stuff on this too, about not only what is an ideal friendship, right? Like you mentioned, but then What's the opposite of that? Who, who are people we stay away from? Who are people that claim to be friends but actually are uh, deceiving and draw us into evil? So the Proverbs and, and even some Psalms have stuff to say about friendship as well. And then, you know, I just recently read an article that was uh, published through Baylor University. And this is by, I've never heard of this person before, but maybe a listener has, Gail O'Day. And she uses, she launches off of the John 15 passage where Jesus is saying, this is my commandment, love one another as I have loved you. No greater love than this, that someone lay his life down for a friend. And then Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command and love each other. And I think that's such a powerful launching point for friendship as well, to talk about how Jesus, who he is and what he came to do is not only an example of friendship for us, but he lived that out. And I thought that was a, it was a beautiful article and a way to look at friendship because she starts with the premise <laughs> of, how, you know, how we kind of started, how friendship has become super secularized, or at least it's kind of been given to the realm of the secular and the church hasn't as much come in to own it, maybe as it has marriage in the family. And so we're led to believe that, well, maybe scripture doesn't have as much to say about friendship as it actually does when we look yeah. we look into it. Yeah. And that's where, you know, we kind of run countercultural when we think about as a Christian, how do I approach friendship? You're going to feel disappointed if your 
desires for friendship are focused on what you're going to get out of it. If it's just transactional, like I need a friend because I need I need this thing or I need this thing fulfilled in my experience as an adult. And as a Christian, that's not that's not our model of friendship from scripture. Our model of friendship is sacrificial, not transactional mm-hmm. types of friendship where people are giving up, you know, like you mentioned, like laying down their lives or people are doing things f- or the benefit of the other person that they're in relationship with. And that changes how you approach your need for friends, the kind of people that you would call a friend when you start seeing the people in your lives around you as people that you are serving through your relationship, not just having this expectation that they are serving you. And not that it doesn't happen both ways, but it's just the difference of posturing your expectation towards what you're doing on behalf of someone else versus just what you're getting out of that relationship. I have here in front of me your bio that says that part of what you do is a social media coach. And I'm so curious because I know that you spend some time on Instagram especially. And obviously you find it useful in a number of different ways to be a platform for reaching people. But in what way do you see social media maybe having a not so great effect on friendship as we have today? Yeah. So, yeah, I love hanging out on Instagram. I'm usually in my stories kind of all day talking with various people that I get to be in community with there. And that's something that I've really intentionally cultivated. And it's such a gift. And it's really just an honor that there are people that would like to be encouraged, which is great. But what I was processing as I was getting ready for this episode is that I really think that social media has made us kind of lazy about friendship Mm. (laughs) because social media, for all the things that I I think are very fun. And so this is coming from someone who loves social media and chooses to be there. And I genuinely like it. It's a fun thing for me. And I know that's not true for everybody, but it has made us or has given us the ability to kind of consume friendships (laughs) and make us feel friendship feelings towards people or their lives without actually needing to put in the work of friendship. So what I mean by that is that you can feel like you are friends with somebody or that you're sharing an experience because you see that their kid did the same thing that your kid did, or they also went through the drive-thru to get coffee on their lunch break. But you're really just consuming that experience. Maybe you're liking a picture. But that's not really a true like person to person interaction. So it's just been interesting to me uh, to process through this, this idea of how we are so kind of numb to this just scrolling through something and feeling a friendship connection. And it's kind of training us to, I think, discount what a, a f- friendship can feel like because we very quickly can kind of get this little, um, hey, you're friends with this person. Remember, like you like this person and their kids are cute. Um, And you're feeling these like little happy serotonin feelings when you see their posts. And really that's wiring our brains to um, set, I think, the threshold for friendship much lower than what it really should be. Oh, that's a good point. I I haven't thought enough about it, although I'm not uh, not on social media as, as often and I'm certainly not a guru, but I actually have consciously thought before, like Steph, for any amount of time that you're on social media or feel this connection with someone through social media, you should consider spending an equal amount of time <laughs> reaching out to someone in in real time that's a little bit more interpersonal than what social media affords. And so I think that takes some very clear intentionality on our parts. Maybe it's a text. So yeah, that's not a face-to-face, but I think it's a little bit more interpersonal than what social media can be. Yep. And to actually voice things that you think. (laughs) So for example, if I see something on social media that of yours that I think is adorable, instead of maybe just liking or hitting the heart, sometimes I message you or say, I love that or I love that example that that you're setting, or sometimes that encourages me to think about reaching out to my friends here locally. Like, oh man, I got to text her. I got to call her. I should invite her out for dinner so I can actually have this one-on-one face-to-face interaction that creates 
a deeper intimacy than sometimes social media can afford. Yeah, I love that. Like if I think that there's so many relationships that would benefit from if you're seeing a post and somebody is having a friendship interaction that they have shared online, instead of letting that be something that you sit and are like, oh man, that wasn't me, let that spur you on to your own relationship development instead of just consuming somebody else's friendship experience because that's what the devil wants. He wants you to consume that and then to feel bad about yourself or to feel less than or to think of your own friends that you do have are not as fun as that other person's friends. Um, and to just think negative um, thoughts about it, let instead that sp- those kind of moments spur you on to the people that are really in your life. And and again, that's where like I love connecting with people on social media, but that love is rooted in the fact that that's not my primary relationship generator, right? Like that's not realistic. You know, my relationship starts first with Christ and that allows me the capacity to have relationships overflow into places like social media. You're not ever going to have your relationship foundation be in social media and then have that flow out (laughs) to Mm. more positive things, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I guess the question is, how can we be more enfleshed in our friendship? How can we actually be incarnate and and with each other, uh, as opposed to, yes, consuming or being transactional (laughs) in our relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. And so much of that, I think, is just what you and I are doing right now. It just takes conversations with people and being reminded that you need to talk to somebody not on your phone today and kind of as Christians, right, like iron sharpening iron, talking with each other about these issues and calling each other out where we're seeing gaps in how we're treating our friendships and our relationships. I think that's great. Yeah. And you mentioned hospitality earlier and how that's kind of been hindered with the pandemic. How do you see hospitality, I guess, kind of being a a forerunner to to friendship or, or or being able to set the table for a friendship to form. Hospitality requires vulnerability. So when somebody physically comes into your house or your apartment or wherever you live, or when they are coming alongside you in a way that you've specifically invited them, right? They're going to see things that you cannot control. There, You can certainly clean your house up to an extent, it, you know, when someone's coming over, right? But at the end of the day, once somebody is like entered into your personal like existence, right? Like mm. you can't control everything that they're going to perceive about you, that they're going to know about you, certainly not in the same way that you could on social media, right? Like you control what you post on social media. So you can really present yourself as a friend in a really specific way, right? But when you're taking on this role of hospitality and inviting someone into something, you can't control what they see and know and start to learn about who you are. But that lets them know that you trust them. And I think trust is such a key part of what a healthy friendship or relationship grows from. So when you allow people in, you're you're taking the you're taking the lead on saying, you know, I've invited you. I want you to know me better, not because I think so much about myself, but because I think it would benefit our relationship for you to get to see, you know, that I don't dust ever and there's mm-hmm. dust sitting on, you know, because you have, you can have so many perceptions about someone and feel like you know something about them, but until you actually enter into a physical moment in their life, you're not going to know the whole, the whole story. And that just takes actual interactions. I think back to, we had a DCE intern at our church, a director of Christian education last year. And we invited her to go on a hike with our family. And our children had just about the worst hike of their lives. <laughs> and, you know, it involved like we didn't get onto the trail because there was a lot, a lot, a lot of little person feelings involved with so many aspects of what we had planned to do on what was supposed to just be a walk on a nice day, right? But we had invited her into this moment and our families life as a way to build our relationship with her. And she, for better or worse, got to learn things about our children's personalities. She got to learn things about how we interact with our children when they are in some of their worst moments. And those kind of things, right, like that takes trust. Like we're trusting that you're going to be with us in this moment. And certainly she could have gone and told everybody that like we're the worst parents or we treat our children poorly or wow, like their kids have this bad attitude. But because she was with us in that moment, right? Like she could see the whole picture. She experienced it alongside of us. And that grew trust in our relationship that we 
we're okay with her being there and seeing some really um, difficult moments for us as parents and families and humans, but that we invited her on another hike, you know, after that. <laughs> and then it, was, then it was up to her, right? You know, she's like, I know, I know what I'm getting myself into. Yet. But it's allowing people to know you in those moments and then still extending the invitation again. And now you're, now you have a risk, right? Like, you know, that they've seen some not so fun stuff and you then have to trust I don't know, like, do they want to hang out with us again because they've seen that? And what a blessing it is, right, when then they say yes, that they do want to still come alongside you. Like you've given an opportunity for them to show you that love back when you extend the the invitation, you know, again and again and again. Yeah. yeah. So she did say yes. She agreed to another hike. I We have a lot of hiking stories. <laughs> Oh, bless her. <laughs> yeah. Imagine hiking with my children. I mean, a simple walk around the neighborhood is in itself pretty, pretty trying and testing yep. at this very but, moment. You know, back to, we, we live in northern Wisconsin. It's a pandemic. There's not been that many things that we can do with our whole family and other people. <laughs> so we have found ourselves on many a, many a trail with many a feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's good. That is a good <laughs> friend to have. And what I'm hearing you say too, I guess, is, um, that uh, it's a very, you know, s- scriptural way of being is to uh, be a friend who endures. So endures you at your worst moments or at some not so pleasant Instagrammable moments, but that they're with you nonetheless and being willing to walk with you and also to, you know, be in- involved in what your your life looks like and accepting this is the Rodriguez family and they're not they're not perfect and they can't you know, they don't have perfect little children and I'm going to come alongside them and and be their their friend through it all. I think Absolutely. that's a hallmark of a Christian friendship is to just to be present, to be living with someone through their seasons of of life. What do you think just a little bit of brainstorm here you and me. What do you think also is the mark of of a friendship that would be centered in the gospel? You know, I think the willingness to not, like to intentionally not be transactional, I think is what I keep coming back to, that it's not, I do this thing for you and then you need to reciprocate something of equal or greater friend value back Mm. to me. You know, we, any adult, whether you're married, have kids, single, any adult experience, right? You have seasons of your life where you have more capacity to give towards other people in your life. And you have seasons where you don't have that same capacity. And so I think like a biblically focused friendship sees those seasons where your capacity is lower as a friend (laughs) to reciprocate things. And instead of seeing that as like, well, I don't have as good of a friend anymore, or I'm not sure if we're good friends anymore because she hasn't texted me in a while. You know, it's just seeing that and saying, I just need to text her more, or I need to show up at her house if I live near her and just drop something off at her doorstep and and overextending yourself in the seasons where you see your friends not having the capacity to do that. And knowing that maybe they will have capacity again one day to pour that back to you, and maybe they won't, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't change how you view who they are in your life just because they may or may not be able to reciprocate your acts of like love and service and grace towards them. Mm. Well, I want to I want to actually get into C.S. Lewis a little bit um, later, but kind of as a as a side note, I think that he's mentioned something really profound. And he essentially in his book, Four Loves, he talks about friendship as essentially being this non-essential part of life in the fact that it really uh it it doesn't produce anything or is is not really even efficient or industrial <laughs> as in um you know romantic love as he describes it is is a a love that you know is in marriage and then produces children and then there's a a kind of love that is affection that would be to allow to raise children but then there's this friendship which essentially is the most inefficient relationship you could have in terms of productivity but then he says something really profound too and he says that you know friendship essentially isn't necessary for survival but it's what brings value to our survival and i think that's beautiful and it and it kind of sums up what you said about it's a uh, friendship in light of scripture is not transactional. It doesn't require something to 
be done for you. It's looking um, to do for others. And that is something that I don't think social media or pop culture can necessarily capture. And I think it's worth talking about so that we remember. <laughs> we yeah. remember it's not about us. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, the social media piece is a conversation that will always be kind of a part of how we experience friendships in our season on this on this earth. And especially because so many people who are around our same age, we've had social media since we were, you know, high school, college age is probably when most of us started using social media. I think I got my Facebook page when I was maybe a freshman in high school. I have to I have to remember. And it changes how we perceive how other people are doing friendship. We have this access to seeing friendship in all kinds of ways with people we really know outside of just what we're seeing on a screen portrayed in like a TV series. We also are seeing friendships portrayed across our phone with people whose faces we actually like have maybe interacted with in person too. And I think that changes how we perceive it also. Hmm. And then what do you think, you know, in, in, in terms of forgiveness and humility, what role does does forgiveness play in, in friendship? Because you could really have a friend and then choose not to forgive them. And then that's essentially the end of your friendship. <laughs> so I guess I see it as pretty essential. And, and then also humility, the way that Jesus would have us be towards each other, which, you know, it says in Philippians to not look out to your own interests, but uh, to the interests of others. So forgiveness, you know, I think in any relationship, especially friendship, like you can't, it's not going to continue if there's not a willingness of both people, right, to repent, extend forgiveness, reconcile. That's how God created relationships to work well. You know, he knew we are sinful, so there has to be something that we can do about that because we can't just go around trying to have relationships with other sinners without a way to reconcile when we're sinful people and we interact with each other and that sin hurts one another. So, you know, forgiveness is such a gift on so many levels, right? But especially when it comes to maintaining a friendship, there is no friendship that is exempt from sin on this earth. So if we're going to be in relationship with each other, like we needed a way for those relationships to be sustainable. So I feel like for me, forgiveness is the what makes a relationship sustainable <laughs> because it's the key that when you hit a point where there is tension, where there is hurt, uh, to just leave the relationship, I think is the secular viewpoint, right? Like when somebody hurts you, Yep. You hurt me. I'm done. Like I'm moving on. I don't need, you know, I don't need a toxic friend, for example. But as Christians, we have an opportunity to not just say this is not good for me anymore, but to sit in it and say there is an opportunity for forgiveness. And that doesn't always work out just because it's available to us. There's, It's not to say that there's not friendships that's still Christian friendships that still don't survive something happening to them. But we do at least have an option uh, to try forgiveness before we just completely kind of jump ship, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Kyla, have you read uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, before? I have. Okay. So I recently, I have read it and then I recently reread it. Okay. Yeah. It's been a while since I've read it. Even if it has, I, I bet you could handle this. C.S. Lewis talks about in his book, The Four Loves, about four different kinds of love as displayed in the scriptures. So he calls these one affection, uh, friendship, eros, which is the romantic love between people and marriage, and then uh, what he calls charity or essentially agape love. So what are your thoughts on these distinctions and, and are they helpful? And if they're helpful, how do they help us differentiate friendship as a love from other kinds of love. Yeah, you know, I think they're helpful to the extent that your brain thrives from like that kind of organization, right? Like to to name something to understand it a little bit better. I think the most helpful distinction for me is just the distinction between the kind of love you would have between a husband and wife and the kind of love that you would have with any other kind of friendship. I especially think that uh like the phrase you know, I'm married to my best friend 
gets gets tossed out there. And I think it really undersells the relationship of a husband and wife when we're not honoring it as the romantic type of love. And instead, we're putting it in this what I think is a lower category, right, of the love that you would have, you know, the love that I would have for you. That's not I don't want to love another person in the same way that I love my husband and vice versa. So to, to that end, I think those distinctions are helpful to remind us that the love that you have in a relationship with your spouse is different from the kind of love that you have with a girlfriend you're going out for coffee, but that that's a good thing that you don't, why would you want that expectation on a person who you're not in that kind of a relationship with? You know, I think it sets everybody up kind of for failure. If you're expecting your um, spouse to be, you know, for me as a woman, if I'm expecting my husband to be my best girlfriend who I want to go out for coffee with and like just talk about all these things, that is a expectation on him that was not intended from scripture Mm -hmm. for how he and I are to interact with each other and vice versa. If I'm expecting the same level of intimacy that I have with my husband on a everyday friendship, that's a, that's a different expectation. That's not like rightly placed either. So that's where I think those kind of differentiations are just really helpful for reminding us that there are different kinds of relationships that we have with other people. And that's okay. Like not everybody is intended to be your very closest friend. Not everybody is intended to be the person that you marry. You know, when we Mm -hmm. look at Jesus and his relationships, even with the disciples, like Jesus had distinctions in his friend group. He had specific disciples that we know he was closer with than other disciples because there are, like not all friends are created equal, even if we should treat them all. (laughs) You know, well, like not all friendships are the same type of friendships. And that's, that's okay. We're not all the same kind of people. So how could we all have the same type of relationship with one another? It's just not, it's not how we were created. Yeah. I think that's so helpful what you said. And, you know, part of Lewis's point is talking about the word love. And what I think is especially helpful is that, and you know, he, he wrote a different decade, but it's still very true, if not more true now, because he says the way that people throw out the word love makes it very hard for us to understand what real love is. And so then the distinctions of the different four loves is helpful so that we can rightly prioritize order and then treat those loves in an appropriate way. And I think that right now when culture kind of, what what I would say, maybe this is fair and maybe it's not and someone can push back on me, but I think in general, right now, culture is telling us that um, friendship is a lot about camaraderie, right? And kind of rallying around similar interests or uh, similar life stages. And part of that can be true, but I don't find it helpful. And I think that friendship is more than camaraderie. I think that friendship in a biblical sense is a very beautiful kind of love that, again, we don't treat rightly because we, we have a hard time distinguishing loves. And I also think it's hard to think about friendships properly when our culture really over-sexualizes love (laughs) and puts love into sometimes a category that is just in terms of a sexual relationship. And then sometimes into a category that is so low as like, I have this love for chocolate, right? Like there are two extremes that our culture deals with this word. And so I think it's helpful to separate this so that we don't get confused and we don't muddy the waters of what our (laughs) vocations are, right? Yeah. So I don't want to come down too hard on this because I've been known to say these things or at least think these things, but I kind of wanted to talk through this with you and maybe you can challenge my thinking or maybe you'll solidify it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, So especially in terms of female friendships, I think of Maybe if I pick up a magazine, I see female friendships portrayed as this wine, cheese, and, you know, chocolate club that you meet up with on a weekend after a, a long week of terrible working conditions or, or whatever and <laughs> gossip and catch up on, on the latest and, and share news about your latest nails and, and hair and fashion and all of that stuff. And I think that in a way that cheapens what friendship actually is for or actually is. And I think that sometimes the way that we talk about friendships in terms of like, this is, this is my tribe or these are my people, especially women talk like this. I think sometimes also cheapens what 
what friendship is. And again, I've been guilty of kind of saying these things or thinking these things. And not that that's an inherently sinful way of talking about it. But I guess maybe what are your thoughts on it? Does it ever bother you to hear people talk about friendship in that way? Or even though there's some innocence to it, do you think that maybe there's a better way to exemplify friendship? Yeah, you know, I think what I find hard well, let me start with this, actually. So I think there's some real value, right, to having people that you have friendships with, right? I think we we haven't necessarily said that outright here, right? But hopefully the fact that we're focusing on friendship as a conversation, right? Like we think friendship is important. I think friendship is a really important thing. Otherwise, I wouldn't spend so much time thinking about it. But I, what is difficult is that our tendency towards these are my people or categorizing the way that you are alike another friend is I think it really just limits. I think it limits how that friendship interacts. So especially being a mom, this gets even more, I think, exaggerated because then you're you're a boy mom mm-hmm. or you're a girl mom or you have there's there's even more ways that women uh, will categorize how they're like interacting with a maybe I'll use air quotes here, uh, friend group based on this one little aspect. So to that end, I just, I think it's so limiting when that's the emphasis all of the time, because instead of, you know, certainly great, like celebrate that you have these sweet little boys that you're raising. That's not what I, that's not what I don't like about it. What I don't like is that it limits how you see interacting with people who aren't fill in the blank. A lot of like the good friends that I have had are not the same thing as me or maybe you know you're you're seeing friendship like I don't have my people <laughs> so you're feeling like now I have this pressure that I need like more than one friend what if you have one really great friend that God has placed in your life like how does that limit your view of friendship like are you discounting the one friend because you're seeing well I'm not it's not my people it's my person you know, and that doesn't, you know, I, I don't think it's, I think it sets everybody up for a lot of disappointment. There's so much that can happen in a friendship relationship that can be disappointing <laughs> as we all come into it with different expectations. And I think that oftentimes uh, people want to rally around something together. And it's exciting when you find somebody else that shares a value or a life experience with you. And it's certainly just logistically easier often to be friends with people who are in a similar life stage as you. But I think it limits greatly just your own perspective of who can be your friend and valuing the friends that you do have if they don't fit into like one of these little categories of Mm. a friend group, if that makes sense. Yeah, I really, I, I really think it does. And you're right. It puts a lot of pressure on people, especially through seeing things on social media for what expectations for life should look like with friends. And that's not necessarily something that's laid out for us in in scripture. Scripture more is, you know, descriptive and exemplary of uh, what friendship is and not so much (laughs) <laughs> telling us to do X, Y, and Z with the number of friends we have or the kind of friends we have. And and one thing I guess I notice is that with those kind of phrases, we can start to think of friendship as as this elite group of of people that we've formed and then we keep others out because they're not like us or uh, they don't share this interest or this pedigree or what have you or this kind of country club feel where, you know, again, that only a few people are welcome. The people who are transactional and pay their dues kind of a thing. When, in fact, scripture talks a lot about being a friend to many. And in fact, Jesus was a friend to sinners <laughs> and people who are very much unlike him and brought a band of brothers together, essentially these 12 disciples who were from all different walks and stages and, and you know, having different socioeconomic economic backgrounds and talks about bearing each other's burdens. So that's more than a, oh, a wine and cheese kind of get together. This is talking real life stuff where we, we actually shoulder another person's hurt and suffering and take that, you know, onto our, onto ourself as well. Yeah. I, if I can, just as you're speaking, it reminded me of an article I read 
And it was the article itself was speaking specifically to just this idea of like, how do I be friends with maybe someone who's making a different choice with their families? You know, fill in the blank. And the phrase that stuck out to me that they used was unity over uniformity. That Mm. as we are in relationship and seeking to be in friendships with other people, that our focus, if our focus is on uniformity, that has such a bigger tendency to be a selfish (laughs) motivation. Um, But when we're just seeking unity with the people that are in our lives that we have an opportunity to be in relationship with, then we are so much more, we're really widening our net and our ability to enter into friendships with people because we're not seeing it just through this lens of like, who's like me? Who can I find that I (laughs) would like to hang out with versus seeking who is there around me that I can be in unity with for the sake of Christ. Hmm. I would love to read that article. I think that's really profound. If I may, because this really struck me, I'm going to read a quote from C.S. Lewis's book. And it, it helped me to reflect on the blessings of my own friendships. And like I had said, for whatever reason, God has found it necessary to bless me with a number of, of, of really deep and meaningful friendships. And one can start to think that has something to do with you <laughs> <laughs> and less to do with God's provision. And this just reminded me and grounded me in the fact that God is the one who unites us all in friendship and relationship with each other. And so C.S. Lewis writes, and this is kind of lengthy, but I think it's worth, it's worth sharing all of it. He says, and this is how he's distinguishing Christian friendship, he said, for a Christian, there are, strictly speaking, no chances. A secret master of the ceremonies has been at work, meaning God. Christ, who said to the disciples, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, can truly say to every group of Christian friends, you have not chosen one another, but I have chosen you for one another. The friendship is not a reward for our discrimination and good taste in finding one another out. It's talking to me. It is the (laughs) instrument by which God reveals to each the beauties of all the others. They are no greater than the beauties of a thousand other men. By friendship, God opens our eyes to them. They are like all beauties derived from him and then in a good friendship increased by him through the friendship itself so that it is his instrument for creating as well as for revealing. At this feast, it is he who has spread the board and it is he who has chosen the guests. And I think that is a beautiful summary of Christian friendship and God bringing people together in unity. And again, goes back to the fact that friendship is a gift a vocation to serve each other and to point each other to Jesus. And so that's why it's worthy to be talked about on this podcast called Friends for Life. So, Kyla, some very practical things as we draw to a close here. How have you seen friendships change as you have transitioned from, you know, college to now being an adult? And then what are some specific challenges to maintaining adult friendships specifically? Sure. So, you know, I think as I was just getting ready for this, I was just processing through how coming from a school environment and then transitioning to life outside of a school environment. So whether that was for you when you left high school and you entered the workforce or if you went to college and then entered the workforce or maybe you went to college and then graduate school and then entered the workforce. But the transition from a school environment into a not school environment, I think, is one that we are all very ill prepared for because in school environments, um, to to the extent of really kind of what a skill of making friends is, is that you are with these people and you have to choose how you're going to interact with them. And since you're with them all the time, often friendship is what is the choice there, right? Because the alternative, it's kind of a difficult way to go about going to class every day and seeing someone every day. So this transition outside of a school environment to the adult environment is what I found to be a just monumental, right? All of a sudden, instead of the choices being kind of confined to the people sitting around you in a classroom or on a sports team or in a group that you are a part of, now your choice is broadened greatly, which in theory, (laughs) maybe you could have so many more friends. But in so many ways, then it made it seem so overwhelming, right? Because you actually had to, at least I had to, I had to like intentionally seek out how I was going to find people to choose to be my friends or to choose to try to be a friend with because they weren't just 
they weren't just there. They didn't just exist for me mm-hmm. to like pick from. So if I think that was like the biggest thing that I that I have experienced is just this transition to having to take more ownership of choosing to seek out friendships. So I guess that that would be one piece of it. And then the other portion of the question you asked was just about as an adult, how, (laughs) what's the hard part about maintaining a friendship? And I think that a big piece of it is, is just that, that you're choosing, you have to choose to maintain any relationship that you have. And you have to choose that it's something of value to you. And as you are in adulthood, there is a lot that can be taking away from your capacity to choose friendships over all the other things that might be on your plate. Maybe your job has a lot of demands. <laughs> Maybe you're married. Maybe you have kids. Maybe you have older family members that you're taking care of. And and all of a sudden, you have these things that you're having to make other choices about. And I think that friendship is an easy is an easy one to just kind of let go if you're having to like pit it against another choice, right? To your to C.S. Lewis's point of that, it's it's not really essential, right? Like you're not getting paid. <laughs> to be yeah. a friend with somebody or to pursue a friendship or to invest time in a friendship, but you are getting paid to do your job and you would maybe like to get paid more. So if you're putting more hours in at work, that has a better return on it. its investment to you, right, than choosing to pursue a friendship. So I think that's the biggest struggle is just that we, um, and, and I think this is actually where the devil just loves to play, right, is that he wants us to believe that we aren't worthy of friendship or the time that it takes. He wants us to believe that we don't need relationships. You know, he wants us to believe the worst things about us and the worst things about everybody around us. And friendship's a really easy way to make you feel like a terrible person or to spend a lot of time judging somebody else. They're thinking like, I wouldn't want to be friends with them. They do this. So I think our biggest struggle then, I guess, as I talk it out is twofold, right? Like when we have a lot of things we're making choices about and we have to choose friendship to be a part of our experience. And two, the devil would love for us to not have friends or would love for us to be in relationships um, where we're choosing that over other things in a really unhealthy way. Yeah, you're right. It, it, and especially I have found that as a mom of young people, that is a particular struggle to make adult friends, but then also in the, the busyness of caring for little people. It's like you feel your concerns are so insulated and, I guess, in on yourself. <laughs> like, it, it's just like, okay, I have to get breakfast and then I have to, uh, oh, make, oh, it's lunchtime. So I have to make sure my kids have lunch and then dinner. It's just like a, a, a repetition of needs constantly around me that it's hard to think outward, outside of my family. But I do think that as much of a challenge as that is, I think it's very much worth the effort of maintaining a friendship, especially in that season. And I I think another particular challenge is that if you don't have school-age kids yet, it's like, well, how do people meet friends? Well, a really good way is to, when your kids are in school, to become (laughs) friends with parents of, you know, your your kids in in school. So that just seems to be a natural setting without realizing also that you have this community at your church who is ripe for building relationship and friendship. So these things take time and they take effort to look outside of ourselves. And again, I think it's very much worth the investment (laughs) to do those things. And that's too where, you know, the, you're, we are all like used to perceiving how somebody's life or friendship is going based on social media. We That's just a part of kind of our human experience right now for most people. So what that doesn't show you a lot of the times are, I think, what we might categorize as more non-traditional friendships or the intergenerational friendships that are out there. You know, some of the um, closest friends that my husband and I have from our first calls in ministry are people that are our parents' age. And that's not necessarily something that translates easily to social media. You know, we're not doing things with them that are (laughs) something that you're going to see. But there's still people that like when we were sick last year with COVID, like drove hours to drop off a gift basket on our front porch and talk to us through our door because that's, that's the kind of like biblical based friendship 
that we have with them. Um, and I think that's where it's the church has such an opportunity as so many people are sitting in their homes or just starting to feel more comfortable interacting again with groups of people, whatever that looks like in your kind of geographic region that we have an opportunity to show what it means to choose friendship in a way that's really different, but so life-giving to not have it be just a, you give me something and I give you something back kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Kyla, what are some suggestions then for people listening who may be really longing for true friendship or this biblical framework, this intimate kind of friendship? What's some encouragement you could give them and and where do they begin? I, this will likely sound cheesy, but honestly, prayer is the place that I would start because in in all things, you have Christ as the friend that you are hoping for. That is a that is a true present friend in your life, and he fulfills friendship in a way that is not you're not going to find with other humans. So if you're especially in a season where you are feeling like you do not have somebody, um, first, just let me speak the truth to you that you do have somebody. You have Christ, and he is the ultimate friend. He is a real friend. He is a true friend. He is a good friend. He is the best friend. He set, He created friendship, right? So there is no one that you're going to be friends with outside of him that will be with you in all things and through all things. So if you're feeling lonely or disconnected from friendship, I would start with prayer and talking to the friend that has not left you, even in, in all of in all of the things that you've gone through, and turning to scripture, because through that, you are going to be ministered to with God's word. And that in and of itself is going to lift your eyes up and out from feeling like, you don't have a friend because I'm guessing that there probably are people in your life that would be love to be your friend and they just don't know that you're lonely or that would love to go out for a cup of coffee with you and they just they just need they're in the same boat like you know I think sometimes it's easy to feel like you're the only person <laughs> that is experiencing something and the reality is is that so is so is everybody else there is not some every someone out there that has like the market figured out on friends at all. It's just a constant changing experience for all of us. So starting with prayer, starting with scripture, being connected to God's word will automatically turn your heart towards seeing other people in a new light. And you can't help but have relationships kind of grow out of that, I would say. That's good. Kyla, what does it look like then as we wrap up to live in friendship with others, essentially to be in community, in a communal relationship with others who believe what God teaches about life and affirm what God's will is for for human life and flourishing. And so essentially I can sum that up to be, what does it look like to be a friend for life? I think that to be a friend for life, there is a choice <laughs> that you're going to make an effort, that you're going to make an effort to listen, that you're going to make an effort to care. And when you're doing those things, um, it doesn't matter if you share the same life stage. It doesn't matter if you share the same belief about everything. It doesn't matter if you both like tacos or not. You know, when you are making the effort to listen to another person, when you're making the effort to care for them, through that, you will grow trust. You will grow a foundation for a relationship that can weather the difficult things that come up, that can weather transitions, that can that can endure differences because you've chosen that you're going to make an effort to say, I see you as the child of God that you are, and that matters. And I can't help as myself being a child of God. I cannot help but extend love and grace and forgiveness towards you. Mm-hmm. That is also a good summary then of what our podcast is, is is learning from each other, as you said, to make an effort to listen, as our listeners do, to make an effort to care for other people around you, as as um, Christ set the example to do. Thank you, Kyla, for being on our show. Yeah, absolutely. It was so great to get to talk to you and just to kind of process friendship. There's probably a lot of episodes you could do on the many facets of friendships and kind of friendships, but it was great to just um, be able to connect a little bit over this today. Yeah, thank you. You're right. In the future, I see devoting more episodes to this topic as well. So 
Thanks to our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. This is one of the best ways for other people to find us and to get to join our community. And don't forget to click the follower subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. New episodes drop twice each month. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS, which is yet another way to join our community. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that introduces listeners to life issues by introducing them to friends who stand for life. Thank you.